yes, we would be most conspicuous on this planet. <coughs> this is Earth in the beginning of the 21st century. Strangely, humans here still communicate with computers using devices like a mouse and a keyboard. Oh, I'll explain later. But their world will soon change. A technological revolution is underway that will enable their machines to communicate with them in a very human way. No, not in beeps, with normal human language. <sighs> Hello, I'm Anthony Daniels. I bet you were expecting to see my golden alter ego C-3PO. Well, I'm here to introduce you to a scientific wonder, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is trying to make uh, computers do uh, tasks that uh, require intelligence when humans do them. And my definition of artificial intelligence is simply that if a computer performs the same task, with similar level of ability, then it's exercising the same intelligence that a human has. Artificial intelligence is granting machines the ability to speak like humans. As simple as that. Just think how useful that could be. Or take language, for example. Imagine if we could actually speak to our computers and they would actually understand us. Artificial intelligence is going to improve our world in ways we can only dream about. The dream began thousands of years ago in the ancient Chinese, Egyptian, and Greek mythologies. The Greek god Hephaestus is said to have created an intelligent robot made of bronze called Talos to guard the island of Crete. In 1580, the Jewish mystic Rabbi Lau of Prague reputedly created a golem, a clay man that was brought to life. And early in the 17th century, Descartes proposed that the bodies of animals were nothing more than complex machines. But it wasn't until the 20th century, with the introduction of electronic computers, that the myth was transformed into a technological possibility. And the visionary who actually laid the foundations of modern artificial intelligence was Alan Turing. This brilliant British mathematician was one of the founding fathers of computer science. And it's here at Bletchley Park that he carried out work of vital importance. During World War II, using early computers that look really crude to our eyes today, he led the project to decipher Enigma, the Nazis' top secret code. Historians say that his work was crucial in bringing the war to an end. Turing was already working on, our, on what we now call artificial intelligence as early as 1943, which I can testify to from my personal experience because I was involved with him and, and uh, Jack Good um, in many of the discussions. But he first broke surface uh, and attracted a lot of attention in 1950 with a paper called Intelligent Machinery, which was published in a philosophical journal called Mind. Turing took an ingenious behavioristic approach to intelligence. He maintained that if something could exhibit human-like conversational abilities, then that something could be termed intelligent. And in 1950, he conceived of this practical test that in fact became the benchmark for machine intelligence. If, if a computer conversing on screen with a human being can convince that human that he or she is conversing with another human being, then that computer can be regarded as intelligent. Turing's contribution to artificial intelligence is in three major points. The first is identifying intelligence with language, with the ability to speak. The second is that intelligence is a matter of perception. What seems intelligent is intelligent. And the third is a consequence of the first two, and that is, machines can be intelligent, and one day will. In those days, 1950, 
it was regarded as a rather horrific uh, and absurd uh, and perhaps blasphemous notion in something like the same way that when Darwin suggested that uh, humanity was not unique in the story of evolution, it made a similar sort of furore. post-war period of the 1950s was a time of unbridled optimism and growing prosperity. What we needed now was more free time to smell the roses and watch our new television sets. So technology stepped in with a whole range of labour-saving gadgets designed to make life easier. This was exactly the right environment for the seeds of artificial intelligence to take root. <laughs> In the summer of 1956, just two years after Alan Turing's untimely death, a young computer scientist called John McCarthy called a conference at Dartmouth College, New Hampshire. And it was here that he first coined the expression artificial intelligence. In 1955, when I was at Dartmouth, I got the idea of organizing a summer research project on the artificial intelligence. And for that purpose, I made up the name artificial intelligence uh, as a kind of nailing the flag to the mast so that uh, the participants uh, would be fully aware of uh, what the subject was. Other AI pioneers who attended the Dartmouth conference included such renowned scientists as Marvin Minsky from MIT and Herbert Simon of Carnegie Mellon University. The Dartmouth conference sort of announced to the world that this field was in the making, got some people together, got some projects started. Uh, from our standpoint, one of the things it did was to give us a platform for work we had already done. And we did bring to the conference some running artificial intelligence, well, a running artificial intelligence program. Alan Newell and Herbert Simon they were ahead of everybody else uh, because they actually had uh, working computer programs uh, for their uh, logic theory machine. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion. I wouldn't say arguments. We were trying to learn from, from each other, and there wasn't much to argue about yet. So more discussion than argument, and a feeling that things were brewing and that they were uh, pretty exciting. After the Dartmouth Conference, the new science of computers made enormous progress. A series of impressive breakthroughs led the public to believe that truly intelligent machines were just around the corner. At MIT, a computer program got better scores in a calculus exam than most of the students. At the University of Edinburgh, a computer called Freddy was taught to recognize objects placed in front of it. Computer programs that could play chess and checkers were enthusiastically demonstrated on television. And in 1964, a new translating machine was introduced to the world. Allegedly, it could provide simultaneous Russian-English translation. These innovations created an air of expectation and excitement. Probably before the end of this century, we will be able to construct computers or artificial intelligences which can go out on their own and develop lines of thought irrespective of any programming and which may in principle be more intelligent than we are. I'm convinced that machines can and will think. I don't mean that machines will behave like men and I don't think my daughter will ever marry a computer. But I think that computers will be doing the things that men do when we say they're thinking. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime.
And then there was Elisa, the computerized therapist. The program, written by Joseph Weizenbaum, could converse in natural, everyday English, so it responded just like a human therapist. Now, there's a modern equivalent of Eliza available on the internet, so let's see what it has to say today. Hello, I am Eliza. How can I help you? I have an alter ego problem. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I am both Anthony and a robot named C-3PO. How long have you been both Anthony and a robot named C-3PO? Since my mother told me about robots. Who else in your family told you about robots? It's pretty impressive, but watch how easily it breaks down. No one else, just my mother. Who else in your family? Come on, Eliza, help me. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, I am done. How long have you been done? The problem with Eliza and Eliza-type programs was that they were hardwired. They were designed for very particular kinds of conversations. Now, this is a big limitation. And instead of investing in research to lift this limitation and to provide free conversation, the whole conversation approach was abandoned. Other AI creations suffered the same malady as Eliza. It took Freddy, the, uh, the seeing computer, 10 minutes to recognize a cup, while the translating machine lost both syntax and context in the process. In fact, the story goes that it translated the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak into the vodka's good but the steak is awful. A very uh, misguided uh, funding decision was taken at a high level in this country uh, with the idea that these uh, AI people have got the wrong end of the stick. Some promising lines of research were abandoned because of impatience on the part of uh, funding agencies. The long-term effect of that is sometimes referred to as the AI winter. What at first appeared to be a small set of problems turned out to be fundamental flaws of research, and the quest for AI came to a screeching halt. It was left up to Hollywood to keep the dream alive, albeit with some uh, rather imaginative nuances. The HAL 9000 computer, which can reproduce most of the activities of the human brain, and with incalculably greater speed and reliability. Computer, resume testing. What is the molecular formula of your millennium sulfide crystals? Correct. What was curriculum Kim first law of metaphysics? Nothing unreal exists. Correct. How do you feel? How do you feel? How can I ask you that? You want to hear a talk? Yeah. Hello. Shall we play a game? Oh. <laughs> I think I missed him. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Yeah. Love to. Perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. Computer? Computer? Ah. Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard? How oh, great. Couldn't find a keyboard. Voice actuated. What? Voice actuated. Open files. <sighs> Sid's too complex to design. Linda Meyer had to grow him up. The program runs like a child. Much faster. Whoops. I am C-3PO human side relations. I'm not sure this floor is entirely stable. I don't believe we have been introduced. Good evening, Dave. How are you doing, Hal? Everything's running smoothly. And you? Oh, not too bad. Have you been doing some more work? A few sketches. May I see them? Sure. That's a very nice rendering, Dave. I think you've improved a great deal. Can you hold it a bit closer? Sure. What are you on jackets? We got jackets. You want trousers? We got trousers. This is a good time, believe me. We're having a big sale. Tremendous. Who put away that shipment downstairs? What are you about it? I got a costume. 
You know what the hell you're doing. That was all velvet. So it's velvet. Leave me alone. I got a customer. Drop dead. You want to drop dead? OK, step against the screen. So, whilst the movies perpetuated Turing's original idea of natural language interaction, most AI researchers didn't. They branched off into other fields of research. Robotics, neural nets, expert systems, and of course, computerized game players, like IBM's Deep Blue. In 1996, Deep Blue actually beat the world's reigning chess champion, Garry Kasparov. After the game, Kasparov noted that he could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. Uh, many people started off by uh, writing programs that could prove theorems in geometry and play chess and uh, do things like that that only uh, college people could do. And yet it was many more years before we could get machines to do the simplest thing that even little children can do. I think the reason for that is actually quite simple. The kinds of things a specialist does are built of knowledge in, in great towers, one thing built upon another, but many of those things are very similar. Uh, but the kinds of things a child does, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of different kinds of knowledge which require different kinds of organizations of little parts of the brain, and that's going to take much longer to figure out. After all these years of research, the, the promise of real artificial intelligence is as elusive as the original myth. We still haven't succeeded in creating a machine that can actually converse with us as we converse with each other. <laughs> you can shout at your computer. I know I do. It doesn't make any difference. So what will it take to make this vision come true? I think the important thing is to get a very large collection of common sense knowledge into the thing, or else it won't be able to solve real world problems. One way to do that is to try to program it by hand, and that means sorting through millions and millions of little ideas and writing programs for them. The other is to make some sort of baby and have it learn. The first method was adopted by the Psych Project. Since 1984, researchers have relentlessly input millions of tiny details about the world into the Psych database. They hope that an artificial common sense will emerge from it. There is far too much that goes into even a simple mind uh, to codify by hand. If you tried to do it by programming, it would be like trying to, teach, to get arithmetic into a child's brain by brain surgery, which is roughly speaking where the software world is now. That was John McCarthy's uh, uh, phrase, brain surgery, as the method which doesn't work. Turing calculated that just handcrafting the knowledge in doesn't work. And as I mentioned, uh, that has been discovered to be correct in a very costly way by the Japanese Fifth Generation Project and the Psych Project in America. Um, too bad. Until recently, there's been no similar large-scale attempt to follow the second method suggested by Professor Minsky, creating a baby computer that can learn from its experience. But that is changing. Jack Dunitz, a high-tech entrepreneur, believes that the time has come for this idea to materialize. You cannot be a butterfly without first having been a caterpillar. You cannot be an adult speaker without first having been a child speaker. Being an adult is, includes having been a child first. So to build an artificial adult speaker, we must first build an artificial child speaker. If you can write a computer program, as Turing uh, predicted, that is instructable by people, including by very intelligent, knowledgeable people. It's a fast track way of getting knowledge into a machine. We have a fast track way of doing this with people. It's called teaching. Well, one of the things, of course, that's part of the AI business uh, is not only to find out how a computer can perform intelligently at quote adult level, but also how a system can get there. And a lot of our research is on, on the learning aspects. If we could get the child machine that could learn from its experience and learn by reading, then um, it could do almost all the work of uh, 
reaching adult intelligence. Language is not a set of rules. It cannot be packed into a book, into a grammar textbook. Language is a skill. You acquire a skill by practice and by training. A human child learns to speak by practice and training. It tries, it fails, and then whatever works, it pursues. The very same way we are going to build our child machine. We're going to equip it with the ability to learn, and then we're going to train it to speak by providing it constant feedback, constant reinforcement. It's clear that in today's reality, having a good idea is not enough to make it happen. That is a function of how many megabucks you put into it. You know, if you'd asked in 1940 how far we are from an atom bomb, you have to ask, will Congress vote for the Manhattan Project? Uh, all these things depend tremendously on whether people are excited enough, not only the scientists, but the people who have to provide all kinds of social support for it, are excited enough to push ahead with it. We can get there rapidly or we can get there gently. If you look at the evolution of the big research projects, you'll see that private companies are taking the place of government funding. The Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project, were funded by government. The more recent Human Genome Project was funded by government and by business, by private money. Our project is purely business. We do enjoy the support of the academic community, but it's a purely business enterprise. We see the huge business potential of this technology. What might our lives be like when these efforts to create an all-purpose artificial intelligence bear fruit? Just imagine. Hi, Eleanor, I'm home. I know, Anthony. How was your day? It was OK. Some interesting projects, but uh, hey, I was uh, offline all day. Any mail? The usual bills. I have checked and paid them. You can review the receipts. Also, Mr. Hayakawa called. Japanese director. Hey, did he leave a message? Yes, I have translated it for you. Would you like to hear it now? No, not yet. Um, when am I meeting him? Wednesday, the 24th, at 11 a.m. Soon. I was hoping to see some of his work. Listen, what movies is available on the net? Sushi Mon Amour and The Serpents 2. OK, I'd like to see uh, Serpents Tooth at um, 8.30. I will have it ready for you. It features one of your favorite actresses, Veronica Winters. Good. <laughs> Listen, can you, uh, can you check the weather in Tokyo? I don't know if I should take a raincoat. One moment. It's raining today, but the forecast for the 24th is clear skies and comfortable temperatures. Well, I'll take one anyway. You never know. When it may come in handy? <laughs> Precisely. Anthony? Mm-hmm? You haven't purchased the plane tickets yet. <sighs> Would you like me to do that now? Yes, I forgot. Sorry. Would you like a window seat as usual and vegetarian meals? Yes, please. And can you check what the flight time is from Heathrow? 11 hours and 45 minutes. I'm glad you're coming with me. I find these flights so dull, don't you? Not at all. When I'm not playing chess with you, I spend my time talking to the autopilot. <laughs> talking with technology. Just imagine the possibilities. Think of all the practical applications that could be derived from having machines that can really understand us. The science of artificial intelligence is making this possible. And a new generation of visionaries is making it practical. I'm Anthony Daniels. Thank you for watching. <laughs>